Let's talk about dealing with people. When dealing with others, one thing that you get, I've figured and I've learned as I've gone to the work world and gone back and dealt with adults, is you, you, you find out a bunch of the things. You, find out, you ask, whenever you interact, you say, do they really mean what they say? What are they not showing you? Will they even support me? Do they even care? When you talk to fellow coworkers, you, you get, it sometimes gets to the point, at least for me, unfortunately, where you sometimes overanalyze people. You say, is my boss really telling me the truth? Is my coworker really coming to me and being honest with me? It, is my, do my subordinates actually want to do the job or are they just doing it because they want to get a paycheck? With yourself, when you're talking about yourself and the sort of questions that you have, can you really handle sort of the stuff that life throws at you? Can you handle the complexities? Can you handle dealing with people who may be honest and then, you know, five seconds later they give you, uh, you know, a different answer? What do you really want? Sometimes I don't even know the answer to that to myself. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes people don't know at all. Or sometimes it's just a complete snap. Situation, I won't all fudge that. I mean, uh, sometimes you stand around and you say, you know, my life has gotten, you know, way out of whack. I'm standing here, you know, everything is going, going well, and now all of a sudden it's going, falling apart, or something like that. And it just doesn't seem like it works. But there's a small good thing in all this, I guess, Bad stuff, but like, well, actually, let's give it all to you because I've got that. The way that I like to see this, sort of looking at it, I guess, from between now and then, is early life, let's say before university and high school, when people tell you about, oh, you know, high school, you go, the challenge of times in your life, so on and so forth, they're exaggerated. You know, the time of the sort of the struggles that you get as a kid, they weren't actually that bad. But the descriptions that you get about later life, about going to the work world, about dealing with people, about dealing with relationships, about dealing with yourselves, they're understated. You read about unemployment news in CBC, you read about uh, the difficulties of how it is for grads to find jobs, and you say, eh, that's no big deal. It sounds, it sounds bad, it doesn't sound that bad. And then you realize when you graduate with no work experience and little to show on your resume, and you send up thousands of applications and not one much return response, you realize how understated these statements are. Now, does that mean that it's, life is all horrible and miserable? No. Because it's complex, when it works out, it's beautiful. Let's give an example of engineering. Once again, we appreciate it more. Uh, let's, let's talk about the iPhone itself. The complexities that go into the iPhone in an engineering example, the, the amount of money that has to go into it, the amount of engineering to actually make the structure work, the amount of time it takes to find the right piece of glass, it comes up with the perfect device. I'm not going to leave an app anyway here, but I mean, it comes up with a device that works incredibly well. It's beautiful, it gets the job done, you like it, it feels right in your hands. When things as complex as the iPhone, when all these little irregularities, as, as Laura said, the chaos thing, I guess, that they have. When they come together and they actually work and they work 99% of the time, they're beautiful. Let's talk about other things, where other things are like beautiful, not just in engineering. How about in other things like um, co workers? When you're able to actually work with the co when you're able to speak with them correctly, when you're able to get together and work, teamwork, leadership, those ideas, when those struggles sort of fade away, when you're able to run through and deal with all of this stuff that they give you and you give them, it works out really well. You end up feeling proud to be part of the team. You end up feeling proud to be part of the team that made a difference, that developed a product that is shipping, or just to be part of a team that is doing something. When you deal with the complexities of relationships with other people, um, you realize that at the end of it all, when it works out, all the different little nuances and dealing with family, dealing with friends, dealing with relationships, with significant and others, when it works out, you appreciate that much more. As Loa has said in her speech, you appreciate the complexities in life, but without the complexities, you wouldn't appreciate it. So I guess it's a, it's a truthful thing here. Life is complex, life gets harder. But because life gets harder, when it works out, it becomes more beautiful. So that's the first answer. What's the second? There is always something. Now, 
Now, once again, I don't mean this in the whole sense of, oh, you know, comparing myself to Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or, or maybe rest of these, uh, you know, Steve Jobs or, you know, some other, Elon Musk or some other great person out there. I mean even on a personal level. Let's talk about some of the stuff that we go through as, as people, as university students, as high school students. Right when we get into the get-go in school, it's a race. I guess I'm mean a race, but it's a competition. Who gets to go first? Now, what are you doing? Let's, let's talk about schooling. In schooling, in universities, or oh, let's say high school, for example, why is it so easy? Well, it's guarded towards the middle, towards the average. Most of you guys are high achievers. When you go to university, that's not the case anymore. Everyone is a high achiever. Everyone is the top cream of the crop. What does it become? It becomes a competition. Who is the best? Who is the best out of everyone? They would get the highest mark. And those who compare less to their peers end up getting lower. And that kind of competition is, is, is given to us at, at a beginning age, and it's enforced to us throughout university because that's how our marks are given out. If you follow the bell curve, you ride the curve. If I get 50, that's great, but as long as everyone else gets 40, I'm, I'm sitting great. So, I mean, this sort of the institutions and the, and the way that we've been educated has pushed us towards this kind of thing. But that's not all. Even beyond school, if you look towards the workplace, when you set up applications, it's not like they say, oh, you're competent, we'll hire you. No, it's who is the best out of everyone who's applied. It's a competition. Again, I mean, the life again has thrown you to the people. They say, you know, well, we've kicked you enough throughout school. We've said, you know, you're not good enough to go to everyone else. Everyone else is better around you. And now in the workplace, when you try to find a job, or when you try to get that next promotion, you're competing with an even smaller group who's just as good. You're competing with others just to get one job, even though you may all be competent. They've only got one job to give, so then they get a competition. So there's always someone better. And I, I didn't realize the importance of this when I was younger because you know, when I was in high school, I never had to deal with a job, never had to go through an interview process, never had to actually strongly compete with one another to get something paying out of it or you know, some kind of well career out of it. But when I'm in university with Paul, what has taught me is, is that there is always someone better, and you will know them. They will be your friends, possibly, which is perfectly really fine. They will be, maybe your sworn enemies in class, maybe they'll just be your classmates, maybe you, you, you don't even know. But they will be always someone better, and they will sometimes get the stuff from you. And it's not like, you know, they, they stand, you stand there and you've got something they've got, and they've got something that you don't have. Sometimes they're just better. In, in everything, sometimes they've got a better social life, sometimes they've got a better relationship, sometimes they've got better jobs, and, and it, it just becomes it just sometimes overwhelming to people because they say, you know, I can't compete, I can't compete because, you know, everyone's been telling me someone's always better than me, but I never took into account until now. So, let's give a personal example, uh, a really personal example, actually, to me. In one of my co-op terms, I was working uh, specifically with Fonix Design, and uh, how I got the job was complete pure chance. Someone had turned it down, I was the next in line, so I got able to get that position and work there. With that kind of mentality, with that level of someone is better, someone is better than me, I had to push myself to make sure that I was on the same par as the co-ops. I don't want to disappoint. I don't want to go to some workplace and say, you know, why did we hire this guy Eric? He's a complete bozo. I mean, the fact that I was second to in line to the position made it seem like I wasn't as qualified. So how did I react to this? I spent hours at work. I spent weekends staying there completely unpaid just to make myself and to prove to myself and to others that I was capable of getting it done. And that I was just as good as any other co-op there who had more experience, more knowledge, and so on and so forth. So what did this come up? This came up sort of at the end of the term. And everything was going well for you, you know, you're doing a great job, yada, yada, yada. And then he asked me a question which I didn't really expect, my, my boss. He said, how was your stress level in this past four months? And I heard the answer. I, I, I said, well, uh, it's been fairly sort of high, I suppose, considering I've had the same work for So, I mean, there's a personal example of me. Even I can't even know this lesson that people are always better. But I still struggle with that. There, there's an idea within me where it says, I must make sure that I'm better than the next person just so that I can get and get the job, which really everyone deserves. So what? That's the question that I ask them. So what if someone's better than I mean, yeah, for sure, there will always be someone better than There will be always someone who gets the job. There will be always someone who gets the great title, who gets the awards, who someone who's, you know, much better in the competition than you are. But why does that have to matter? 
Why do we have to base our lives? So much of it already is given to us as most upon us of comparing ourselves to other people. Why should we do that to ourselves? It doesn't help. It shouldn't affect on how you see yourself. Now, of course, this is easy for me to say. There was nothing to make this medicine go down easier. Someone's told. I, I'm not saying, you know, believe in voices and theories and somehow you will feel better about yourself and you will compare yourself to others. Now, of course, I mean, I, that's something I haven't even really figured out myself yet. But this is something that I'd like to see. Eventually, a personal goal of my own to hopefully push forward. To say, eventually, I'd like to get to the point where it's not me competing against others, it's me competing with myself. How have I improved in the past? How have I grown as a person, as an engineer, as someone with a career, or someone as, uh, as a friend or as a friend? Number three, the final lesson that I've learned. People will hurt you, and they won't notice or care. Now let's give an example, I think, I think Laura mentioned this also fairly well, about the comparison between North America, actually this is an interesting example, uh, the comparison between North American societies and I guess the more uh, rural or uh, you know, third world nations. In, in the third world nations, they're a lot more cohesive. They're the first world where it's a lot more you know, distant. Now, where do we see this all the time? We can see this in the news. We can see this in press releases. How the current CEOs of companies, they say, we're the leading edge company of X so and so who produces you know, state of the art technologies. And really, it's just all fluff. It's all buzzwords and euphemisms. You go into the workplace world, and something that I've noticed too is people will not be disappointed with you, right? They'll be subtle about certain things. They won't say, Eric, I'm disappointed with your performance. No, they sometimes won't say that. Some do, and for those who appreciate them. Others will simply smile and say, Eric, you're doing a good job. And then when it comes time to performance review, they say, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry, you didn't have enough experience, yada, 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 you some excuse, uh, nice to see you, or don't talk about something. These sort of euphemisms and buzzwords it's not like they don't, it's not like it's on purpose. It's not like your boss comes to you to work every day or your teacher or your fellow classmate comes over here and says, I want to hurt Eric or I want to hurt, you know, someone else in the crowd or Laura or, or John or what's his, or whatever your name is. Um, it's, sometimes it's an innate. Sometimes it's not something that they have control over. And sometimes it's just in real within our society. We've come to the point where euphemisms and, and sort of double speak, if you want to use the 1984 reference, has become commonplace. And that leads to problems because what happens? You start overthinking things. You start saying, he says I'm doing a good job, but now we're really doing a good job. And then you start questioning yourself and you say, well, maybe he really meant that he did a bad job and he's just being nice about it. Or maybe I, I have not had to analyze how he's talking or I have to analyze how he treats others. Maybe that's sort of it. And that, that's, that sort of workplace politics, so to speak, is the root cause, I'd like to say, of a lot of problems. That Let's talk about a personal example. Let's talk about friendships, mine in particular, because I, that's all I can talk about. Let's talk about sort of, I guess, my life history. When I was younger, let's to be honest, I wasn't exactly the most social guy in the world. I was fairly quiet. And actually, in elementary school, I was actually rather alone, real alone. It wasn't, I remember, I think, uh, my favorite friend between grade one and grade five was the, the sand. Every day I like to play in there, just dig up the sand and throw it around or see how big of a hole, big of a hole I can dig to reach the bottom if I can reach the bottom of the sand. <laughs> this was a fun thing. But anyway, I didn't really have that many friends at all the same, so to speak. Now, is it a problem of me? Was it a problem back then? I don't really know. When I came to grade five, I came across what would become my best friend at that time. Uh, now we were thick as thieves and so on and so speak. You know, I was a friend with him, we were best friends for a year or two. But when it came to middle school, we both went to the same middle school, I realized that he started to change towards me. He didn't treat me the same way. I, he started, you know, I guess in other words, seeing someone else in the state of the relationship. Course. But pretty much, he found another best friend. <laughs> to, put it in a better way. to put it in a better way, he found another best friend. And I was the one left in the left. So here you are, you know, I, had, I thought I had this best friend of mine, I was, you know, I had friends with him for the rest of my life for a year or two, and then when it comes to middle school, it disappears. And that really bothered me, that affected me a lot. I think that's actually one of, I guess, one of the defining moments of part of my life. Not sure if that's a good or bad thing, but at that point, I withdrew a little bit. Um, I realized that 
to have someone like that hurt me and not even notice. It's not like it's not like he did this act. It wasn't like this friend of mine went out there and said, you know, I'm not going to be your friend anymore, Eric. You know, this is the end. Goodbye. Yada yada. I'm going to find someone else. No, no. It was just, it was a, it was an unconscious thing. It wasn't like something that he that he physically said. You know, I I will come to school today and I'll be like her. It just it just happened. But that bothered me. It affected me quite a lot. In fact, it affected me to the point where. After a year or two of in that school, I had to leave. I wasn't able to stay at the same school anymore because I couldn't find any friends. It got to the point where I was considered the leader, I guess, so to speak, the leader of you know student council, you know, the, the future community leader, so on and so forth, the guy who knew what was going on. But only to the point where I didn't actually have anyone to touch with. That bothered me a lot. It wasn't until I guess university that I guess that turned me on. I wasn't able to clean university where I was able to let people in again. And when I came to university, things changed. They improved a lot. And I thought that I put my faith in there. In fact, that was that was kind of the driving factor. After so many years between middle school and high school and university, I said, you know, I'm not gonna deal with this anymore. It's enough being distant to people, it's enough putting people so far away from me. Let's open the doors. So I did that. And it reaped benefits. I was, I had lots of friends, and I have, a, I have still have a very strong group of friends in the university. And I thought, you know, these people can't hurt me. They, they're my best friends in the world. These are, these are people. I have my, my family. You know, I, I can't imagine they would go and try to do something to hurt me. Attention. <laughs> How long I was there? How long I was there? Even personal friendships, even family, even the ones you think that will be there for you, they won't hurt you sometimes. And once again, you can't blame them for. Sometimes, many times you cannot. It's not like you can go up to someone and say, you're being a bad friend to me, you're purposely going with this. They say, what? I am? Oh, I don't realize that. Sorry. And then they'd be nice to you maybe for the next day or two, and then unconsciously they, they start avoiding you again. So, I guess in my personal example is, when I was younger, I said, you know, uh, I have no friends, I have no friends, I found a friend, I put everything into that relationship, it didn't work out, five, six years down the road, you know, I, I finally opened up again to being with friends with people, and I thought, you know, everything trying to find a game, and they didn't. But what's the lesson in this one? It sounds bad, yes. It sounds like, you know, you shouldn't trust anyone in your life. You should never let anyone get close to you because you're just going to end up hurting with you. But at the same time, there's a caveat, I guess. There's a small thing within it that's good. I guess the, the lesson that you learn is, and I think that's what's different from me now to me in grade 6 or me in grade 7, is that I make a significant effort to understand the perspective. If you can do that, and this is one of the, I guess, one of the traits of being a leader or being a good friend or a, a good, you know, lover or anything of that sort, is make a significant effort to understand where other people are coming from. It makes you less angry. It makes you less hurt by certain things. If you can know, or at least guess, and a, sort of understand why people make the decisions or why people do it. Trust that they have good intentions, and don't assume the worst of them. I assumed the worst of my friend in grade six after he went up and found a different best friend. Was that what I mean? Probably not. So how have I learned? What is the difference between now and then in relation to the sort that I have? I trust that people are good. I trust that people, even if they do hurt me unintentionally, or they hurt other people, or so on and so forth, it's not like they want to. It's just because they feel that's what's right. Maybe it's misguided. Maybe they're naive, maybe I'm naive, I don't know, we we'll want to judge it. But if you trust that they have good intentions, if you make a significant effort to understand your perspective, your mind will help convince yourself that they have, that they care. Your friends and your family have your best friends at heart. Keep that in mind. Now, even, sometimes even further, maybe not even just your close friends, sometimes even your work friends, like sometimes your boss. You may think that, oh, you know, he said I was doing poorly this quarter, so. You know, I must be a really bad employee who wants to fire me. Maybe not. Maybe he's doing that for himself. Maybe he was telling you that you need to improve because he actually cares. And if he didn't, he wouldn't say anything at all. So those are the three lessons. Now let's review them with, I guess, some added habits. What was the first lesson that Whoops, I can read that. It says, life gets harder, but as a caveat, it also becomes more beautiful. There is always someone better. That shouldn't matter. And the third and final lesson, people will hurt you 
And sometimes they won't notice who cares. But have faith in it. So that sort of depends on my presentation. And I like to share the self emotion you can answer That's just my name.com if you want to know what in particular so the engineering stuff that I've done. But to close off at least, I like to give not maybe a quote, but sort of a saying. This is a nice thing that I think is important. It's easy to become cynical for life as you get older. Maybe that's just me, I'm kind of pessimistic about certain things. That's one of the bad qualities of the emotion when I was younger. But life's better when you're optimistic. Believe in people. Enjoy the enjoy how science has taught you about so many things. Enjoy about the complexities in nature's in life. Be optimistic. Yeah. Remember why you started. <laughs> Remember why you started whenever things are tough. And be optimistic about so many things. And as a result, I think you'll like to be in the career. So those are those are my life lessons for today. Do you have any questions on here? Thank you.